today. That's really good. Really lovely to see you. And I've had a great time here. I've been just so happy and so free uh, at these meetings. And somebody's going <laughs> like that. <laughs> Hasn't been too steep. That's good. <laughs> well, pardon? I did. Put your seat belts on. That was last week. It's not so bad this no. week. <coughs> we can't stay on developing a positive self-image and being high forever, can we, you know? Right, I mean, the, uh, we've got to have a, a positive self-image, but that's such a good subject to preach because you can, you know, <coughs> you can lift people high. Now we're down a bit. Well, today we're going to speak on mending broken relationships. And uh, these are important keys to opening the door to a happy marriage. And they are for ladies who have husbands who are unsaved, for those who want to restore their marriage, and one or two helps for making your husband the head of the house. Now, first of all, it is absolutely imperative that we pray about anything we have to change and pray about our marriages and bring the prayer, the power of God into our prayers <coughs> and keep on dreaming that dream that things are going to change and keep on speaking out, I'm expecting a miracle every day and look for that miracle and you'll have that miracle. That's right, isn't it? We've got to look for them if we're going to have them. Now... First of all, and we also remember that believe God is going to work in your situation, I think we've just said that, and he is on your side and the heart of God is for you to have a wonderful, <coughs> happy marriage. Now, I would like for us to say, for us to all together, and I'm going to ask you to look it up in Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, to make a start with the word of God today, which is so important. And it's a very good for marriage or anything that we're entering into, trust in the Lord. It starts off with, you know it. But I'd like, because this is so close to my heart, uh, this uh, verse in Proverbs, I'd like for us to all say it together. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy paths. Isn't that great? He will direct thy paths. Acknowledge him. Now, number one on my list, and you've got it there, is wisdom. And Proverbs 4, 5 says, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the word of my mouth. Now what does that mean? God's saying, don't turn your ear away from my mouth. Listen to what I say in my word. Follow what I say. In other words, he's saying, cooperate with the word of God. That's wisdom. That book, the Bible, is full of wisdom. Proverbs 4, 7 says, Wisdom is the principal thing. And I can never forget that. Wisdom is the principal thing. In our family, my husband trained us along that line. Uh, all our lives we've followed that. My two girls and myself and my husband. Whenever we had a big project or something new coming up, Tom would say, get us together and say, now let's consider this. Are we doing the wisest thing? Now that's, that's good counsel, isn't it? How many times have you and I done things in our lives that haven't been wise and we've been very sorry afterwards? We've had regret. Seek wisdom. And I think you need it more than ever when you're, if you're restoring or doing, and even enriching your marriage, we all need that with wisdom. Proverbs 31 verse 26 is the words of the Old Testament Bible wife. She opens her mouth with wisdom. Well, when I first saw that, I thought, well, sometimes, I mean, perhaps it's a better idea to keep your mouth shut than speak out and see if wisdom is going to come forth. I think that's important, isn't it? 
Now the next thing we're going to talk about is communication and that is extremely important in marriage. Without communication, your husband and yourself, your marriage will not survive. All marriage counsellors will tell you that. If you do not speak to each other, it's just mm, mm, first thing in the morning and mm, mm, last thing at night, and there's nothing to say, your marriage is really finished. It's called silent divorce. <laughs> Don't tell me you're experiencing that. Anyway, it's a good thing not to let silence reign with any member of the family. It's extremely important <coughs> that we do not allow silence to reign with our teenagers. They misunderstand a lot of things. I love to see people agree <laughs> with me. It's really good. Now, did you know that adultery slays thousands of marriages? But did you know that lack of communication slays tens of thousands of marriages. Now, and what amazes me is this, as I go around, I'm, or in our own church, one of my lady friends came to me one day and said, my lady friend, 63 years old, has separated from her husband. Well, actually, he separated from her. He just came to her one day and said, I've got a flat and I'm leaving you. Now, they were, they're lovely people, but they have grandchildren that they should be together enjoying. Now, what did it? Lack of communication. He found a lady that could talk to him <coughs> and he could have fellowship with, and he was just off. That's a tragedy, isn't it? And that's what is happening so much in the world today. I think it's sad. Right, now there are books you can buy on communication and there's one from your library. There's also another one by Norman Wright, but they are excellent books. And if you're having a problem communicating, you may need one of those books. I don't have any trouble whatever because I very rarely stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> that keeps it moving. Right. Now, think of ways that you can communicate. I can think of dozens of ways. And if I can, you can. Manoeuvre to communicate with your husband. Now, I'm not going into this in full because we haven't got time, but I'm going to give you a few clues. Spend time in the evening and begin carefully to talk. If you haven't been talking, it might be a bit of a shock. You know, this is where wisdom comes in. There are many ways to manoeuvre to communicate with your husband. Talk. Be a talker. Talker. Talking has many values. Talking clarifies thoughts. Thoughts are clarified as we talk. We don't know what our husband's thinking. And, you know, lately I've been thinking that uh, I've been doing it a different way. And when Tom says something and I, and I think... Does he mean that? Is he talking to me about that? What is he saying? What I, is that? You know, I think he's trying to tell me there's something the matter with me, and then I should be different, or you know how you think. Oh, and and I now I've got a way, and I've only done this late. I wish I'd done it before. Mm -hmm. And I say to Tom, "Tell me what you meant. What was in your head when you said that to me, dear?" And he tells me, he's very open, we're very open with each other. And I said, I thought that you meant such and such. And he said, well, do you know that never entered my head? See, we think wrongly. And oftentimes we become hurt. And they're not hurting us at all. That's when thoughts are clarified through talking. It's through talking you get to know each other. You never get to know your husband if you don't talk. Now, it's a great thing to... Ask your husband a question. That, I'm going to give you another little hint on that little lower <coughs> down. Ask questions. Uh, you, uh, say to him, I would love to have your opinion on this. Now, I do that a lot because 
I've discovered that Tom has a different attitude to things left a long time ago and I think it's good if we're going to do something to find out really his attitude or uh, towards a thing and then I know I don't have to follow it but it's nice to have the opinion of another person just the way they think so and this is a way to communicate ask your husband a question so I value your opinion on this now the thing for you to do is listen you know, in a marriage where a wife says, anything you can do, I can do better, that marriage will never work. <laughs> Listen and value his opinion. Let him see you value what he's saying. Never appear bored. Keep on listening. Be interested in what he says. And no matter what he says, never make him feel small. Just listen. If you disagree, you might like to say so. And uh, uh, later on, uh, maybe, maybe you don't. If you're starting to communicate, I guess you wouldn't do that. You'd just keep on listening. Completely respect his views and be really interested. I think that's a great way to begin communication. And another way is to develop togetherness. Being Developing being a companion that we did the first week. And a good way to do that is try to do something together every day. I know it's not easy, but that's a great way to make a pal of your husband. Now, I know this is very important. If he loves cricket and watching cricket on TV, you watch with him. And you say, but I don't know anything about cricket. Well, learn to know about cricket. So that you, I uh, followed cricket very closely when I was young, but I forgot about it. So I, I'd sort of got a few new... Th I, I had a look at it and study it a wee bit to get a few ideas so that I can talk intelligently to Tom about it. Fortunately, he's not a cricket addi addict and sits all day long. In the holidays, we may have an hour on cricket, and that's enough for me. But then there's tennis. Now, both of us love tennis, and we do a lot. That's our Christmas holidays, looking at the tennis and watching it. We love it, and we can talk about it, and we both understand it. If your husband loves golf, learn about golf, so that when he comes home, you can talk to him about it. Then there are other projects, as the garden. Well, I can't really say that we've had perfect... Um, fellowship over the garden has been a few hassles but when we get settled and get a few things done we can enjoy our project together and that is really good we have a lot of in, in common then if it's only taking the dog for a walk at night if you both love your little dog we don't have one that's another project you can get into that what about your little baby that should be a source of pleasure to both of you and you can talk about and have it put the baby on the floor and have fellowship together uh, uh, over the baby or, or your teenager. I think there are so many things that you can do. There's just a few starters and I can't see how they, they couldn't w uh, begin to work for you. Now in a marriage it is very beneficial as I've just said to ask questions. You can also make statements. Now this is what I could do but I can't, I'm, it's not me, I couldn't do, I, this is what would be fruitful for me to do, put it that way, but it's not me really. I could say, Tom, dig a big hole in the front lawn, I'm going up to the nursery, I want a silver birch on the front lawn, and I'm going to go out and buy one, will you have that hole ready when I'm back and we'll put it in? <laughs> but it doesn't work that way, well, I don't think that that's the right way to do it, so what I do is, I ask a question. I say, how do you think a silver birch would go on the front lawn, dear? Well, I'm sorry to say that that sets our project back about two years. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes we've got to wait, wait and we'll say it several times more uh, before we do anything, but now we have one on the front lawn. And I don't think a house is a house without a silver birch on the front lawn. <laughs> and I just praise God for that. It's coming on so beautifully, it's unreal. Now, the next point is this, homecoming for your husband. Now, every book that I read says it's the man's, your husband's high point for the day. Now, it starts with some girl uh, having lying in a bubble bath from... Um, four o'clock to half past five and then dressing in scanty clothing. This is the girl for that. 
if you want there. She's a really a past master at this dressing up for your husband to come home. But that hasn't been my way at all. But I'll tell you this, it worked because the last place I did this seminar, a lady, she's not got to be 60, she gave her testimony in front of all the ladies. Her marriage, they hadn't been uh, communicating for quite a time. And she decided one night to dress in up in see-through, uh, lace see-through <laughs> blouse and all the, you know, the rest that goes with it. I'm not quite, you know, uh, knowledgeable enough to know all the other things you do because I have never done that. But, and her husband, she set a beautiful dinner out, candlelight dinner, and her husband came home and it was a real success. Do you know she told us? She said, really, it was just like our honeymoon all over again. We haven't been close for years. And she said, do you know he came to church next Sunday? <laughs> so there you are, girls. That might be the way it works. I don't know. But she, uh, she had a great time and she said it's done wonderful things for her marriage. Now, and it is all... Uh, it, and whatever we do, it is very important that we make it a great time. I believe that. And we should be attractive, clean and tidy. And if you can't brush up much and you've got little children, when you hear the car coming, rush to the bathroom and put some makeup on and, and tidy yourself up and be as tr attractive as you can. You know, I believe that men are attracted to beautiful women, but which it said last week or the first week, we're all beautiful because we, we have Christ within us. So it doesn't matter really. But, you know, I believe that Eve must have been the most wonderful creature that ever was. And, and you know, <laughs> uh, when um, Adam saw Eve, I think he must have been really thrilled. You know, people get that idea that she was God's first woman that he created and she would be just fantastic. And I believe men are made that way. And we should be as beautiful as we can be. Well, I, I am really efficient at welcoming my husband. I really, I, because I just love doing it. I wait for those, the cars who, uh, as a matter of fact, he was at a prayer meeting at six o'clock this morning and came home at half past seven. I'm looking at the clock and I, I'm, you know, I opened up the door and I, I hadn't seen him really all day. And I, I love it and I, I'm vivacious about it and I always tell him how pleased I am to see him and, and thrilled to have him home and I just love it. Now when you get your husband inside the door, a lot of ladies like to sit them down and get them a cup of coffee or tea and have a chat, but a lot of uh, men are too tired these days. They just want to sit down, have a drink and, uh, uh, you know, just relax and, and, and don't talk. But if your husband will talk, that's good. And if you've got teenagers, I know a lot of women who have teenagers, not little crawling babies, and they have 20 minutes with their husbands there because the teenagers are okay. They just look after, they're older, they look after themselves. But it is important that we um, do welcome them home. And it's good for children. Little kiddies, two, three, four, five. It shows them you respect your husband, doesn't it? Make a fuss and say, Daddy's home. It's great. Leaving in the morning is important too. Now, something a bit more solid. Forgiveness. The sweetest word in the whole of the English di dictionary is forgiveness, but the hardest to fulfill is to, to, to forgive somebody. Often, because when we have been young, when we are children or we go to school, oftentimes our parents have told us we've been taught is if somebody doesn't like us or they say something nasty to us, you don't like them. You just, you know, that's the finish. And we've become used to that. And when we became Christians and we found we had to love everybody and forgive everybody, that was a bit of a new one for us. But, you know, it's well worth it. Life is not going to be the life that you want in Jesus Christ if you have unforgiveness in your heart towards anybody or grudges. And, you know, we've got to face it. We've got to see that if we have got that now the test is this can you say to everybody that has passed down passed through your life I love you can you say that to everybody that's the test of whether you've forgiven or not and you know life is not going to be very much to us if we live with unforgiveness this very last Sunday where we were ministering a lady came out to be counseled who had such for 20 years 
She hated people, absolutely hated. She was bitter, resentful, and she hated. She said, I hope they come to a sticky end. I hate them. They come into my dreams at night, and I'll never forgive them. Now, that's bad, isn't it? That's bad. That's, now, what, that's not that. I said to her, well, you're not really hurting anybody but yourself and you're also bringing bad health. Your chemical poisons or poisons are going throughout your body that will make you very ill. She said, I'm ill now. But you know, we also do, that, that's a bad unforgiving case, that we also do have little grudges and things like that that stick with us and we should give them away because if you read the end of Matthew 18, you'll find there that there's a power and a person who will haunt us if we are unforgiving and he'll never let up. We can never be crystal clear with God while we have that uh, situation in our life. Now, there are very heavy penalties. Now, in marriage, it's rather beautiful. With your husbands, girls, be quick to forgive. As soon as you know that you have said something, that you, perhaps that you shouldn't have said, you go to him and say, please forgive me, dear. Now, he could have been very wrong too, but you do what you know God wants you to do. Forget him and you do it and, and, and make that a habit. Now, if you feel that, that, that he was very wrong, you can tell him in love, Ephesians 4.15, uh, 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 speaking to him, speaking the truth in love. But be quick to forgive. And do you know what's going to happen? I'll tell you because it's happened to us. As soon as one begins that in their marriage, the other one follows on and your husband very soon is going to come to you and say, I'm sorry, dear, please forgive me. And it's going to be a marriage of forgiveness. Isn't that great? You couldn't have anything more wonderful in your life than to uh, have a marriage of forgiveness. It's just heaven on earth. We have that and I know I'm speaking... I'm speaking the truth. Now, here's a beautiful scripture, Ephesians 4, 31 to 32, and it's from the Living Bible. Uh, if you haven't the Living Bible, or I don't think you have, I'll read it to you. Stop being mean and bad-tempered and angry, quarrelling, harsh words and dislike of others. should have no place in your lives. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another just as God has forgiven you because you belong to Christ. Now I want to tell you a little story about myself here and I don't know whether you've been caught in this, whether you've been terribly hurt by somebody, terribly, terribly. I had been terribly hurt, torn to pieces by this person and those little hurts kept coming up and then I felt I'm not forgiving and then I'd say, I want to forgive, and I'd try to forgive, and then the hurts would come up. Anyone had that? And you just don't know. You, you, you say, well, I'm, I haven't forgiven if these hurts are coming up. No, Lord, I don't know where I am. Please help me. Well, the Lord said to me, I want you to say, I love you for a couple of days as often as you can to that person while you're driving the car at home or wherever you are, just minister love to that person wherever they are. Just say, I love you so and so. Well, I did that and I felt this thing lift off me, this, this hurt. I felt forgiveness coming. It was just tremendous. And would you believe it? I ran into that person. <laughs> Isn't God good? And I just put my arms around them and I hugged them and I hugged them and I hugged them and I wept and wept. I sobbed, I couldn't stop. And do you know my love for them and my forgiveness began to flow, the hurts went and everything was mended. And it's been the same ever since. <laughs> so there's something for you if you get stuck. I'll tell you what, girls, I was stuck. Now the next one is respect and we did that in detail last week. Now we're on to unsaved husbands and I know there are people here today who want to hear this. Now one of the most glorious times in a woman's life is when she was born again but unfortunately when she makes that step which is so wonderful and the greatest miracle in life she has grave misunderstandings with her husband and I want to talk about that. 
Your husband senses that somebody is coming between himself and you straight away as soon as you tell him. Now this is interesting. Even if he has not been close to you before, he has this feeling. Isn't that amazing? And this seems to mean to me that he's been desiring a closeness but he hasn't known how to, be, to get close to you. That could be his one flesh uh, relationship. He doesn't, he's a yearning to be close to you but he doesn't know what to do about it and he just feels when you uh, want to go to church and do things that you're going to be drawn further apart. Does that make sense? Now listen closely. He is shaken, he is shaken, your man, until he is assured of his rightful place in your heart. Isn't that amazing? Excuse me, I've got to go over here for something. Have a mind in that Bible. Here it is here. And I want you to turn, I'm sorry about that, Elaine, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 2.14. And this is going to shed light on your problem. I'm sure you must have heard, thought about this before, but we're sharing it today. It's great, what I call great stuff. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Now, let's... 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, that your husband who is unsaved, he doesn't receive the things of the Spirit. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Now do you see what that's saying to you? Spiritual things such as being born again and things of the Lord and wanting to go to church and prayer meeting at meetings and even prayer and talking to God are foolishness to him. That's what he thinks about it. It's all foolish. When you see that, you learn a lot, don't you? I'm, su I'm sure you've seen it before. Now you, his one flesh, have entered a foreign territory and he has no knowledge of that foreign territory, whatever. He can't understand what you are about. Now this is the key, as I see it, to the whole situation. Your role is to work to let him know he still holds his rightful place in your heart. And with him that's got to be number one. Now women say, but haven't I got to please God? I've, that's the life, isn't it? To please God. But see, so many women don't realise that when they're pleasing their husbands and doing what I've just said, they're pleasing God. Is that clear? <coughs> That's what God's telling you to do. After you are born again, you're, you change dramatically and that's good. You want to get out to prayer meetings and church and be with people who are born again. You're a brand new person and you want to get moving in. You have a deep desire to fellowship with these people and I said go to prayer meetings and, and, and all these things and that's good. But your husband, uh, he can't understand why you want to do those things. Now unless we can channel these things with wisdom, we are in trouble. And we have seen, my husband and I have seen over the years in the ministries tragedies all over the place. Now the when the charismatic move started first, women just were, were up high, weren't they? You know, everything was... <laughs> <laughs> and first the, the dirty washing and the lot, you know, I'm going to a prayer meeting, you know, almost. Well, you see, there was a lot of misunderstanding and there was a lot of unhappiness and homes broke up. But you see, there was no... We didn't know what to do. It was the same with in, in our church with Tom and me earlier back 30 years ago what do you do when this happens you know and but since then books have come out praise god for that and we've learned a lot of lessons and there's a lot of women making a success we have a lady in our church at burwood who's been born again for years and 
I don't know how many years back, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And she'd just been living a life alone in the Lord and pleasing herself. And her marriage was about to break up. And somebody came along with this book, You Can Be the Wife of a Happy Husband, and she's put that completely into practice. And her husband's on the verge of coming through to the Lord. Isn't that good? She's had to do a lot of...